have the latches. I want to tell you that there's an exit over in that corner that's open. If we ever had to get out in a hurry, we could get out that way and this way. So it's just important to say that. Um, but um, I'm Mary Ellen Copeland, and I'm the chair of the Dummerston Conservation Commission, and uh, we have a mission of educating the public about the uh, natural resources of our area, and so we try to um, bring people in that um, can share what they know um, with everybody who'd like to come, and it's exciting to us tonight that so many people wanted to come. Uh, and we're, we're co-sponsoring this tonight with the Bonnie Dale Environmental Education Center, and Patty is a naturalist at the um, Bonnie Dale Environmental Education Center, and I don't think I probably need to say much more of an introduction Patty. Well, I I can't I tell you. <laughs> it's my mother, and um, I am so thrilled to see so many friends of beavers here. And before we commence, they really are such important animals. I just want to point out my partner in crime here tonight in the back there, Skip Lyle. Yes, he's very tall, and um, Skip is going to take over the second half of the show, which is the most important half, which is how we learn to live in harmony with these very important animals. But first, I will take you out to meet my friends in the woods of Marlboro. I'm going to stand back here because I don't have a... Can I stand back here? Or do I need a button pusher? I can stand back here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Lights. Rodents. Rodents. Yes, beavers are North America's largest rodent. And there are lots of reasons to be very impressed with beavers. I have always admired and loved beavers, but not necessarily any more than any other species. However, they stand out for a number of reasons. Okay, technology. Oh, these darn things. Return. Advance. Hmm. Okay. This is this is a beaver. <laughs> In fact, this this beaver's name is Willow. You can see she has a flat tail. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, this is a new one, and we're going to figure it out. Anyone know how to make a slide advance? What's that? I don't think so. It's pretty well illuminated right here. Where, yeah, where's the teenager? I'm hitting all the buttons that usually work. We're going to try enter. Does the arrow work? I'm trying the arrows. Oh, jeez. That would be a pain. But yeah, we may. We will go to the next. <laughs> so one of the things that beavers do for we people in Vermont is um, they create habitat diversity. And for those of us who love to hike through the woods of Vermont, it's mostly woods, 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 until you come to a good beaver stream, like the one you see in this picture. And this is the stream in my backyard where my beaver friends live. It works now, it works, the arrow works. Uh, let's see if we can get the arrow to work. This is my house right here. And uh, as soon as I moved in there, five years ago now, I headed right out here to this brook because I knew that's where the wildlife would be. And, and it was. I found this pond out there on that September day, and um, there was a beaver swimming around. That was before I met my muse, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, this is a picture of Skip Lyle's pond. And just to illustrate what beavers also do for plant communities, you do not find these plants growing in a forest. So without beavers, we don't have these open meadows in, in natural Vermont, at least not very often. It's the succession from beaver pond back to alder thicket, perhaps even to forest, depending on how old the pond is, that, that really um, creates the diversity and the beauty associated with beaver habitats. Okay, my muse. This is, this is Dorothy Richards, and that year that I moved into the house in Marlboro, I discovered this book. 
Uh, actually, a friend gave it to me and has regretted it ever since. <laughs> and and um, she had beavers introduced into her backyard in New York State and when they were reintroducing beavers back in the 30s, I think. And she didn't think much of it until she went out some months later and discovered that her back 40 had been transformed into this spectacular pond full of herons and wildlife. And she sp started spending every evening out there with the beavers, just watching, watching from afar and very quietly for the first year or so. And eventually, after a number of years, she really became accepted as part of the beaver colony. This is the, the Jane Goodall of beavers. And she became so enthralled with the beavers that she finally got a permit to um, keep a couple of beavers in her house. So this is Hunk, who was raised as a kit in the pond that she and her husband created in their basement. <laughs> and they, it kept getting more and more elaborate. Finally, they had this thing they called the, the Y. It was a pool, a swimming pool, with a little swinging door so the beavers could come and go from the house. So, and here's, here's what beavers do in houses. <laughs> Oh no, not not my house yet. I I yeah. <laughs> so um, she really gave me new insights into the intelligence and personality of beavers after watching them for forty years, both in the wild and in her living room, and uh, revealed them to be not only very intelligent and creative, but affectionate and with a sense of humor. And so I decided. I am going to make the acquaintance of some beavers myself. And so the next spring, I headed right out there with my kit, prepared to sit on the shores of that beautiful pond until the beavers became my friends, or at least weren't afraid of me. And inspired by Dorothy, I decided that um, rather than hide somewhere and act like a predator and try not to be noticed, I would just sit there and try to ignore the beavers, or pretend to ignore the beavers, act like an herbivore, just going about my business as non-threatening as possible. And that first day, the beavers swam by and slapped their tails a few times, and then got busy on the far shore. But at the same time, there was a, a goose nearby. Um, so I decided I would test out my wildlife taming strategy on the goose. And so I, I said hello and then proceeded to pretty much ignore the goose. And uh, over here you can see an old beaver lodge. And this goose's mate had a nest on that beaver lodge with nice eggs. And, and the next day I continued to speak pleasantly to the goose and the following day he came flying up over the beaver dam honking raucously and his mate flew off her nest and joined him and they did this little honking duet and then he swam right over to where I was sitting and strolled up the shore a little bit and yawned and spread his wings and uh, then he turned around and went back in the water and I thought Oh, this is, I'm so good, I'm so good. <laughs> and until he came back the next day and said, okay, what'd you bring to eat? And I said, okay, this, this goose has obviously met people before. But I was really looking forward to having Henry, the goose, and his family come and join me at my picnics while the beavers were off doing other things. He was very handsome. I loved his feet. He would just... Once he'd had enough to eat, he would just stand there next to me and look around, and he was a great companion. Uh, but one day, a couple weeks later, from my house, I heard geese flying over, and they sounded very distressed. And when I went down to the pond that evening, I found the eggs all smashed, and the geese were gone, and I think probably a mink got the eggs, so that, that little 
fantasy was not to be. However, that same day that the geese disappeared, this beaver here came swimming over to inspect the poplar branches that I had dragged down to the pond with me. And uh, from here, I will, I'm going to take a slightly different tack and just tell you that I have now spent four summers with, with these beavers and have learned a lot of different things. So we're going to start with the things I have learned from these beavers. The first thing was how they eat. This is very cute with that um, poplar stick. This is Popple the beaver eating it just like corn on the cob or, or typewriter. They, they are bark eaters, among other things. They also eat any herbaceous plants in the summer, but strictly vegetarian, strictly herbivores. So he would take this piece of stick that was just long enough to handle, nibble the bark off all the way, give it a turn, start at the other end, just like, just like the typewriter, until it was naked. That was, that was very good. And so, no, they don't eat fish ever or salamanders or anything like that. One thing I discovered that they do eat, which was kind of interesting, because in the books it says they don't, at least some of the books, and, and uh, that's evergreen branches, balsam fir and spruce and hemlock. And if you think about it, those things really, well, you can tell by smelling that they have a lot of really potent chemicals in them. And beavers eat a lot of strange plants, and you can yell at me, Skip, if I get anything wrong, um, that they divert into their scent glands. So each beaver has a very personalized scent, uh, and often made up from these really indigestible compounds in things like the evergreen trees. And they use this scent to recognize each other. Now, this is a boring slide. It's going to get a little bit more interesting because this is a beaver making a scent mound. Um, yep, okay. Let me double click it. Oh, come on. Should we try the little arrow? Uh, oh, come on. Go to the next. Go to the, uh, we, may, we can go to the next, but then we'll miss Willow making a scent mound, which is very amusing, especially if you're a second grader. Okay, well, what she's doing is uh, just piling together. Come on, you can do it. Oh, shucks. All right. Um, they climb up on the bank and just scratch together any debris that's around, and then they walk back over it and do this cute little waggle dance while they squirt onto it the contents of their castor glands and anal glands, and it creates just this very wonderful aroma. <laughs> And they do this mostly in the spring, and it, it tells all the beavers that might happen to pass through that way just what the status of the pond is and the existing beavers, and really generally keeps other beavers away. They're very territorial. Is it just the males? Females do it too. Yeah, that was actually a female in that picture, but mostly the males, I'm told. This sad valley that I live in doesn't have any of the beavers' favorite foods, so they make do with other things like yellow birch. Now notice where the brook is here, and this next picture is that same tree. By the time they finally chew it down, the pond is right up there to the rock. So they were, they were persistent, but they like yellow birch and beech, and sadly not red maple, the one thing that really grows in abundance in amongst the conifers that really line this whole stream. They also like rodent nuggets. And these, these are uh, the rodent block you can buy for pet rats at the pet store, but it's also what uh, rehabilitators feed to orphan beavers when, uh, or in captive situations. So they're very nutritious and apparently tasty. They also eat apples. They, these beavers are not interested in corn on the cob or carrots or parsnips or turnips or... What other fruits have I tried? Probably melon. Yeah, only the apples and the rodent nuggets and an occasional grape. I've also learned that beavers and, and other rodents quickly become quite tame in the presence of large potential predators if you do offer them food. And there are a lot of things you can learn this way. This is willow probably the ninth or tenth time I visited the pond. 
And this is the mother beaver, and she says, oh, okay, what did you bring to eat? And beavers are uniquely, or almost uniquely, suited for this kind of study because they're always in the same place. You know just where to find them, and they're so connected to their watery habitat that they're not going to become nuisance animals and, and go up and start knocking on people's screen doors and, and things like that. So um, the things you can learn by developing that kind of relationship with an animal are, are different from the kinds of things you learn by just hiding and watching and remaining completely apart. And so some of the things that uh, I learned are things you learn this way, like um, this is Listen to the sound effects here. This is probably just a few weeks after I started visiting the pond. If we can get the movie to play. All right, what's wrong with this? Okay, back, back. Oh, darn. Click on, we'll click on the little arrow. Um, like... Oh, let's try, let's try and show and see if we can play it this way. Oh, no, it's giving me a question mark. You know what? I think it just didn't load the movies. Oh, that's too bad because this is Willow eating from my feet. You make the noise. What do they sound like? <laughs> well, they're not, they're not too noisy when they're eating um, rodent nuggets. Sticks, they're very noisy. Okay, view slide show. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> I discovered a couple years into this project that beavers weren't the only rodents coming to visit. I saw one night a little red-backed vole scurrying away with one of the rodent nuggets. They're, they're very cute little woodland voles. So the next night I brought sunflower seeds with me and left a little pile of sunflower seeds and occasionally I would just shine my flashlight over there and boy the little rodents came from everywhere. These guys are either deer mice or white-footed mice uh, and, and do bury the beaver. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and these, I discovered, I didn't know this before, that these mice have cheek pouches like chipmunks and stuff their cheek pouches and cart the seeds away. I also learned that uh, these ones don't have shells on them, as you can see, but if you bring seeds with shells, um, some of them will shell the seeds and stuff the shelled seeds into their cheeks, and others stuff the whole seed in, and some do a mix. <laughs> if they stuff the whole seeds in, they look, they look really silly. <laughs> and really, it takes about five minutes to get them from there to there. <laughs> and, and within an hour, they really don't care what you're doing. They'll just <laughs> come wherever there are seeds and sit there and eat. And the other mouse that came was, uh, they were really charming, jumping mice. Um, they would come and, and there would be three or four of them and whenever one would bump into another, they would both leap into the air and do this series of hops. And sometimes you would have four or five just hopping around randomly like popcorn and bouncing <laughs> off your shoulder and into your lap. This, this picture here, this little guy accidentally got itself into one of my squirrel, baby squirrel enclosures, but I put this picture in here to illustrate how long their tails are. Look at that. I mean, you would expect a mouse's tail to end somewhere here, maybe, and it just keeps going and going. They're, yeah, they're really amazing little guys. Other things I've learned from the beavers, oh, and this is another movie that's not going to play. This is, um, this is Bunchberry the beaver. He's the father beaver of the clan, the colony, and they, well, he especially spends a lot of time grooming. <laughs> oh, dear. So first he starts grooming here with his hind feet, and then he rubs his little nose with his little stubby front paws, and then he reaches around and does the back of his tail, all with nice sound effects, too. So... Um, if there's time at the very end, I do have these movies on here and can probably play them for you, but 
uh, their coats are very important, but I just learned last night that more important is all that thick layer of fat that beavers carry around all the time in terms of keeping them warm. Uh, the coat is about 10% responsible for keeping them warm in the winter, and the rest is that fat layer. Uh, beavers also really rely on their hearing to warn them if there's danger coming. So when Willow's eating a rodent nugget, chomp, 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 and they chew very slowly and methodically, um, she has to pause every once in a while for, to see if there's danger, and she, she'll look up at me like this. And if I say, it's okay, Willow, she'll, or if I say anything, really, she'll just start eating again. You can recognize Willow because she always looks like she's nervous. She's, she's kind of a bug-eyed beaver. So don't assume she's nervous just because you see her eyes like that. And so here she goes back to eating. Yes, there we go. So you were asking about the flash, and at first, the first year, the first summer, I would go and leave when it was getting just so dark I couldn't see to get home. But when it started getting dark earlier and earlier, I said, all right, I'm just going to bring the flashlight down and see if I can get them used to the flashlight. And it turns out that beavers are really completely unaffected by light at night. And you can shine very bright flashlights at them and they don't turn their heads, they don't blink, they don't seem to notice in any way. And flash photography, flash is going off all the time, they don't even seem to notice. And um, I've heard that their eyesight is, underwater is similar to what our eyesight is when we're above water and vice versa. So what they see when they're above water is similar to what we might see underwater. And I think they're also very nearsighted. So when I toss the little ones an apple, or the big ones for that matter, they can't find it visually and they'll wa walk or swim right by it multiple times, but use their nose eventually to home in on it. So Snowberry, there's a beaver right here. Snowberry, the one who only eats apples and is a little bit shyer than the others, now comes and stands next to something she can see, a large object like my feet. <laughs> Usually my feet, but if there's a stump that's closer, she'll just stop by the stump and wait for me to stuff an apple underneath her nose. <laughs> and when it's right there, oh, she's, she's a happy beaver. So beaver family life, beavers are in a group of unusual animals that includes uh, penguins in that you can't distinguish the males and the females and uh, they have a lifelong pair bond and both parents help raise the kids. So this is Willow and her mate Bunchberry and this is Ducky, one of the, their first offspring. And of course, the first year that I met them, I was, I was very eager to see my first baby beaver. And when I saw them towing branches to this old beaver dam, I figured out that they had made a nursery inside it. And uh, I waited and waited. Baby beavers are born completely furred with their eyes open and their teeth emerging already. But they won't leave the lodge for about a month, I'm told. And uh, when they do, sometimes the parents actually have to help them get through because they can't dive yet down out of the lodge. So they have to come out and learn to dive. And finally that year, I saw on August 1st my first baby beaver hanging out over near the lodge. And I didn't see it again for a couple weeks. And then one day, Mama Beaver, Willow, comes over and is eaten a couple slices of apple and then in a very uncharacteristic way she turns and disappears and comes back a little later with this guy here in tow. Ducky, now not a very tiny baby beaver anymore, and it was really wonderful to, to get to know this little baby beaver. That's Ducky. The babies especially stick their tail up out of the water for balance when they're eating. Oh, that was another movie you're not going to see. So there's another picture of Ducky the baby beaver. How many in a litter? Now this family, they're in very poor habitat. Each year, for four years now, she's had two kits. 
And each year, one of them has been killed by a predator, and one has survived, which is very interesting. And um, I've learned that the different sort of each, another thing, we'll back up a little bit more. Each year, these beavers build a whole new pond system, again, because the habitat is, is mediocre in this whole valley. If the habitat were better, would they have more in a litter? Yes, probably they would. Like <coughs> Dorothy Richards, who brought her beavers piles of poplar branches every day, her mother beaver had six kits two years in a row. And this is, this is one of those stories that's almost unbelievable. But they were so familiar by then that the second year, um, the mother beaver brought two of the kits over and dumped them at Dorothy's feet and said, you raise these ones, and left. <laughs> And the, bee, the babies tried to follow her. Mother brought them back and left them at her feet again. So she got the message and she raised them and then reintroduced them to the, the family later where they were, they were embraced again. So the third year that I was watching these beavers, they settled in a really ugly place. I called it Lake Dismal. It was just in a spruce forest. I didn't know what they were thinking. Um, but it turned out to be the best beaver watching place of all because it was a narrow small pond and that year as soon as the the babies came out of the lodge they followed their mother right up onto the bank so this is baby dewberry and within a few days baby dewberry was eating apples out of my hand and of course there were two baby dewberries and coming ashore like this made me nervous too and I think a bobcat ate one of them and then this one became a little a little more sensible and stayed in the water more um, but this beaver who is now uh, our yearling beaver is still very charming this is this is dewberry who's not shy at all about wondering where the heck the food is <laughs> Ah, so beaver seasons. This is their, their very busy time of year. They've got to do a lot to get ready for winter, but when they're ready, beavers have a, a relatively comfortable way of spending the winter, if you don't mind being stuck in a lodge with a bunch of other damp rodents. <laughs> so the first thing they, they need is they need to have an impoundment, a pond that's deep enough so that it's not going to freeze to the bottom. And this is the, the lodge at Lake Dismal. When they first moved there, they had a burrow in a bank, and um, then they eventually started piling all these sticks and other debris on top of that. And at this stage, I could look right through this latticework of sticks and see that they had dug up through the ceiling of their old bank burrow, and I could see the little fuzzy, dry baby beavers in there. That was very nice. But soon they did what beavers have to do to get ready for winter and had plastered the whole thing with mud. I spent a lot of nights sleeping next to this beaver lodge once the bugs stopped biting. And all night long you would hear uh, this, uh, the, the beaver's feet as they gained speed getting up this runway to get up on top of the, the lodge and drop their loads of mud. They hold it all embraced between their, their front and then they would take the sticks and work them in just the way they wanted them. Yeah, plastering it on the outside. They were working all night. Yes, beavers are nocturnal and all night. Every, I know it was all night because every once in a while they'd wander over my feet or come <laughs> snuffling around and say, are you sure there aren't more apples? <laughs> And in the morning, at dawn, they would still be there, but they would disappear shortly after that. And the next project they have to undertake is um, getting their winter supply of food. So this pile of sticks you see over here is their food cache. And they have enough there to, to last the whole family through the winter. So once the pond freezes over, oops, here's, they, this is how you recognize an active lodge in the winter they don't put mud over the very tip top or at least not very much so enough air flows through that they have a vent and if there's a hole melted in the top you can 
tell there's somebody inside. Isn't that amazing how they know these things? But once the pond freezes, they are really stuck in that dark, watery world for the winter. Uh, they, they don't like that, so hey, it's working! <laughs> this is Willow demonstrating her efforts to keep the ice open. But they really don't venture out onto the ice. This is as far as I ever saw her get from that hole because they're obviously very vulnerable if they're skating around on the ice. And once the pond freezes, while well, you've still got black ice, you can walk around outside the lodge and, and see the beavers swimming in and out, and you can see all the little sticks floating to the surface once they've debarked them. And this is the top of their food cache. <coughs> and then they have to wait and wait until there's a good thaw around March, and now the beavers are able to come out, and because the snow is still so deep, they can climb up and reach these branches that they couldn't reach before. Happy beavers. And finally, everything goes. This is Snowberry and Dewberry and a movie that's not... Wow, where did this come from? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> We've got sound effects here, but no motion. This is really sad. And I don't know how this got here, but this is the, their little brook during Hurricane Irene. Um, and since, yeah, there's water flowing down here and way into the woods back there. They, yes, they were all fine. Oh, okay, so now it's spring. There, and there's little Dewberry enjoying the spring, the season of leisure. However, it's also the season when um, the two-year-olds usually head off on their own. This year, the two-year-old, Snowberry, decided to stay around, and maybe because there's enough food where their new dam is. But the year before, Ducky, the very first baby beaver that I met, it was her turn to disperse, and off she went. And I had to go f looking for her. I looked high and low. I finally found her in a little tiny pond. These slides have gotten a little mixed up here. Um, all by herself. She seemed lonely. The habitat was sort of mediocre, and I just felt kind of sorry for her. I was really hoping she would find a mate, and I think she was too. And later that summer, to my great happiness, I found her down on the main brook again with a new pond, and this is Ducky following an apple, and over here there's another beaver. She found a mate somehow. I don't know where he came from, he or she, frankly. I, I don't know the sexes of these beavers. Um, and that was a very wonderful thing until this guy, Bunchberry, the papa of them all, decided, well, I shouldn't say he decided. It may be Willow decided, but altogether, the original family moved downstream and gave Ducky and Growler the boot. And this was getting kind of late in the season. I was worried about Ducky. I looked for her up and down every tributary I could think of. And was there actually aggression there? Or oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I assume so because Snowberry, once they had all moved down, um, little Snowberry, the yearling, swam up to me that first day and took an apple from my hand and then started going sort of a beaver hostility thing, took the apple a little ways away and then started charging at me, little bluff charges. I just laughed at her, but, you know, it was obvious that there's, okay, I know I'm supposed to be driving away people, beavers, sisters, brothers, anything that's not my uh, little nuclear family at this point. Um, so, and there was lots of scent marking going on. And this year... Um, it turns out that Ducky and Growler moved back through the pond again, and this time this guy received a couple of significant injuries, and I had a major, he had an abscess in his arm, and I was afraid he wasn't going to make it. it. would almost serve him right, but no, no. That's, that's, it's, that's what you have to do to be a beaver. They really depend on a very limited amount of resources in this valley, so they've got to, they've got to, yeah, they've got to protect them. So, dun, dun, da, da, 
um, because it's so hard for beavers that disperse to find a place to settle around here. Because of all the roads that follow these low gradient streams and because they're so easy to trap anywhere they beavers settle near people they they often get trapped out. But fortunately for beavers we have Skip Lyle and I'm gonna turn things over to him. Uh, yeah this is a, the greatest uh, audience uh, population density I've ever had. <laughs> Specialist in uh, this, these things I generally call flow devices. It's a broad term. There's a lot of different types of flow devices. Um, but the reason I, I focused on this one thing for decades is because of the, obviously the importance of, of wetlands and beavers. Um, because at, at any given conflict point, if you can't protect the human properties non-lethally, the only other option is to kill all the beavers for, for all time. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's us fortunately, because our, our population densities have gotten to a high enough level, it's, it's usually not that long a time. So, so it, it may represent, it does represent an endless cycle of killing and a very, very uh, inadequate form of defense. Because once the beavers are killed, nobody's um, left on guard at a road culvert, which is the most common conflict point, to kill the, the next beaver that, that comes along, next uh, dispersing beaver. And they're great, they're great dispersers, they're great explorers of the landscape. So if there's a vacant habitat, they'll, they'll find it. Um, but anyways, and, and so in addition to that, I've found that, that uh, you know, flow devices, um, because if they're well made, they represent a, a really good long-lasting uh, form of defense. So in addition to, to saving uh, indirectly our ecosystems and making them much, much better, um, they also save our economics. They save a lot of money. Um, but it hasn't been very long uh, since we've needed them. I mean, my grandparents, for example, uh, ne never had an opportunity uh, to see a beaver or of even greater interest to me a beaver created habitat with all the tremendous dynamics uh, involved in them. And, and my parents only saw, saw very few. So we're lucky, we're lucky. Beavers just uh, uh, dodged the extinction bullet only about 100 years ago. And so despite all the conflicts, we, we live in a much, much richer world uh, thanks to their, their uh, strong uh, recovery. Um, so, Patty, somebody needs to advance the slides for me. I'm sorry. So, so I mean, beavers are known as a keystone species. They're arguably more, more valuable ecologically than any of our other species. Um, and, and, and Are we ready for that one? What? Are we ready for that one? Oh, sure. It's pretty bright, isn't it? Um, but, but that's, it's partly because, you know, we know that wetlands are incredibly important, but, but because they're, they're just rich, they're full of life. Um, but in addition to that, they're very, very rare on the landscape, particularly in a, a mountainous uh, part of the world like, like here. Um, and in addition, we've, we've destroyed about 50% of, of our wetlands in the United States permanently uh, through development. Um, so that makes the few wetlands we have, you know, and it's a, you know, beavers may influence, um, you know, one, two, maybe three percent of the landscape, depending on how flat it is, and, and that's it. That's it. Um, where they dam is, is totally predictable. It's totally dependent on, on uh, physics. Um, beaver damming habitat is low-gradient low areas on small streams. Once you get beyond a certain point, you won't have to worry about finding beaver dams because they, it's just too, they're too vulnerable when the dams uh, blow out during high flow events uh, to predators and, and to the elements. So they're just on high in the watersheds. Um, so consequently, you know, the, the, the conflicts are, are limited. In any given town, you may only have 10, 15 uh, chronic conflict points. And if, if you eliminate those, then your, your, your problem's over for a long, long time. 
So yeah, the, the beavers are, you know, because uh, these habitats are so important to these other species and, and thousands of others, uh, beavers are kind of the guiding, guiding and, and, and the stewards of these, these, these other fellows. Okay, Patty. I guess I've made that clear. And, and this is, I mean, this is really why I, I got into this work, because I was lucky enough to grow up in Grafton on, a, on what became, went from a man-made pond to a beaver pond, and I've been watching it um, develop ever since for decades. And so I, even from the very early age, it was obvious to me that, that these places um, were just, just uh, pulsing with life um, relative to the adjacent upland. So I got a few examples of that life. <laughs> okay, Patty. It's so diverse and so colorful and, and, and makes so many nice uh, sounds. And you know, when the, when the uh, moisture and sun conditions are just right, you realize how many spiders are out there uh, because the, the wetlands are full of, uh, full of uh, insects. And then you get some bigger animals as well. And there's, the moose is framing the beaver lodge with its, with its ears. <laughs> And, and boy, you know, uh, th these, these places are so important to, to deer. They, they just spend uh, uh, a good part of their summers in wetlands. Uh, not only is there a lot of food there, it may, there's probably no ticks. Um, there's no, there, there may be less deer flies. Uh, it's also a much safer place in, uh, to, to, uh, to avoid predators like coyotes. Um, it's escape habitat. I consider um, wetlands, because deer have longer legs than, than, than the, the uh, dogs that chase them, um, they can, if there's, if there's water, several feet of water in a wetland, it, it can be considered a chase breaker. So really important when they have water in them. Next, please. And then, this is really interesting here in the North Country, but uh, once our wetlands freeze, they become accessible to a whole bunch more species. So you'll have turkeys out there uh, uh, browsing in wetlands. Uh, this is a, a rough grouse track right, right next to a beaver dam. Um, here's a, a fox changing directions. So they're, and uh, these are mule deer, not white tails, but they're right in the wetland in the, in the, in the winter because it's, there's a lot of browse there, a lot of willow. Um, Okay, next, next slide, please, Patty. So, so typically, when we think of, uh, you know, the, the importance of beavers, if we think of it at all, <laughs> which is all too rare, unfortunately, doesn't seem that way in this in this crowd. But, but we we think of the wetland itself in, in the beaver dam, and of course, that's that's incredibly important. Um, but they also do do a lot of things within the wetlands. To, even even if it's a non beaver created wetland a lot of the beaver's activities will make it uh, richer, better habitat. But before we, we move on to that, um, this is my property, and uh, I call this the terraces. And this is the, uh, the, the, the original pond, which was man-made. It was made before beavers had, had returned from the fur trade. I mean, they, haven't re they didn't return until the 1970s. This would have been ancient beaver habitat. Um, um, but I also wanted to note, because I spend most of my time talking about the, the habitat values, that these, these places are also sponges um, during large-scale flood events. And I've seen this several times. Where the, you know, I have a whole series of beaver dams, and uh, particularly when it happens uh, late in the summer following a drought when the water level is down behind each of the dams, and then you get a big flood that, 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 that just absorbs an amazing amount of water. So beavers are just great diggers. They're, they're tremendous excavators or, or rotor rooters, if you will. <laughs> and so they're, they're just carving up the wetland with those little powerful paws that are, that are so uh, delicate. You know, they can delicately manipulate the finest sticks, and yet they, they can just, uh, they can, they can uh, you know, just move mountains if they wanted to with those tools. And so they're always making um, uh, new canals everywhere. And that just creates more diversity in the habitat, more water depths, breaks up the vegetation. It, it just makes it better uh, for everything. And uh, you know, keep in mind, this is a native species. Every, all of our native species evolved side by side with beavers. So 
in my opinion, almost anything they do is, is actually uh, benefits native species. And this is, this again, you see, you know, you might pick up some trails through here. This is just all, all uh, broken up by the beavers. This used to be, too, that, that place, excuse me, that's on my pond, and it used to be a solid uh, monoculture of cattails out, out in here. And they've just disappeared. The, the, the beavers have, have eaten them all, and, and uh, it's very interesting. This, this, again, this is in Massachusetts, another place that was just absolutely solid um, cattails. And this, all this opening was, was created by the beavers. And so, it, you know, there wasn't even a place for a duck to land before. It's a, a, a flow device there. And, and, and here's a, a, a cache looking down. This is the beaver lodge built around this, this oak tree. And just, uh, you, know, you know, imagine the structural uh, diversity that creates in, in, in that area and, and the amount of uh, other, other species that use that. And then we're a species too, right? What's, you, know, you know me. I mean, there's no, no more interesting, fascinating place to hang out in the world than a beaver flowage. The flowage is a term I first heard in Maine, but I think it's good that... Uh, that these t types of wetlands, which are so unique, have their own name. And beaver lodges are, are great fun as well. And uh, this one was about 12 feet tall. So it was on Penobscot Indian land in Maine. Incredible structure. But they're, uh, you know, they're great microhabitats. Often, you know, so beavers creating, creating their own topography all the time. I don't know. <laughs> I never know. I never know. Uh, without thermal imaging equipment, it's very hard to say. But I, I would suspect it's on the high end of, of you know, the, the, the range of, of family sizes. Uh, it's, it was an incredibly uh, wealthy habitat, and they hadn't been trapped in a while. So, I, you know, I'm, if I had to guess, I might say 10. But it's, it's just a wild guess. It's very hard to know. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's also, I mean, there's, everything was going for it. You know, it was, a, it was a massive clear cut that the Penobscots bought. And so it was all generating, uh, regenerating in birch and aspen. Aspen's their favorite tree, tree food. And it was all just small, just the right size. And then it's, it's underlain by glacial marine clay, which is really easy to dig. So everything was working in the favor of the the size development here. And then again, as I said, no trapping, which is really important too. Um, but anyways, yeah, these are, these are wonderful microhabitats used by, by all sorts of species for a lot of different things. Next please, Patty. And they're really hot. They are hot. And so on an infrared photograph, they show up as white dots, really distinctive. And you can also see the you know, series of dams there. Um, it's interesting that there's two lodges side by side. Uh, and, and they seem to be often fairly close to the dams, too. And, and on a number of occasions, I've seen big snapping turtles right on the apex of the lodge, basking in, you know, in, that, in the warmest place around. And so, so, yeah, if you think about it, you know, below the surface, beavers are constantly uh, digging and creating underwater topography. And then they heap stuff up and create, create these uh, eskers, if you will, uh, called dams, and then there's, there's these, uh, these lodges, so all kinds of topography being created. It's, it's quite, quite amazing. And, and as, as Patty noted, you get uh, Canada geese uh, nesting on these lodges, as well, well as other fowl quite a bit. Uh, frequently it's the only island in a wetland, um, and offers them a little bit more security than, than they might have in the mainland. And, and it, they're, also, uh, they're also predator magnets. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're frequently full of mice as well as you know, maybe muskrats, beavers. Um, so if, in the wintertime, if you go to beaver lodges, there's, there's often tracks of, of predators that have, who have been there before. And again, humans, humans. Those are my little humans. Now, now as tall as I am. 
Yeah, so I, I, I always like to, to touch on the, the history of beavers and the history of the, the landscape changes associated with it, because it's so important to put this into context, I think. Uh, so let's, let's uh, talk about the fur trade, which began roughly around 1600. And you know, beavers were the coin of the realm, and they were on the maps. Uh, this is the, the uh, coast of Maine here, and uh, that's uh, the Green Mountains, probably Lake Champlain. So they, the, the, these animals were being pursued uh, heavily, and they disappeared very quickly, um, very quickly from the eastern uh, New England and the eastern seaboard. And of course, um, you know, beaver dams don't persist in the absence of beavers, and that's, that's why it's, it's so important to, to be able to protect our properties non-lethally. But uh, the, the dams quickly develop. Uh, they get uneven because beavers dam at the water line, and so, so uh, uh, an active beaver dam is perfectly level. But as soon as the beavers are gone, it starts to erode and decay and gets uneven. And then when you get a high water event, it'll eat into the low, lowest point instead of flowing evenly over the whole dam. And so the, then the wetland drains and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, the soils are so rich. They're so rich in these places. Um, it's, it's just a boom for, for trees for trees to, to colonize. Um, and, and of course, it's, you know, there's all that sun. Um, but, but, but trees, um, we don't have trees that survive and live in the water. So the only reason our, all of our wetlands disappeared uh, and, and uh, became forested is because of the long-term um, extirpation of beavers caused by the fur trade, hundreds of years. Otherwise, you'd have beavers intermittently damming these very predictable spots and uh, you, trees would never have a chance to get established. Did I see a hand? I know that was me. Okay. Well, if, if somebody has a question in, in the middle of this, that's fine. Um, so go, go ahead, Patty. Yeah, so they all became uh, hats, uh, decorative hats for Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, a, a million beavers or something. Who knows? But, but an awful lot. An awful lot. Uh, they, 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 make, they make very good felt. And so uh, this, I studied a watershed in Maine, and uh, which is really how I know for, for sure that they were, they were they just all these floges, which, which are extremely distinctive patches on the landscape when viewed from above. They're always open, open patches in the eastern forest or any forest. Um, so, and, and again, as I said, they're, they're, you, know, they're, you know where those, you know, you know where the beaver ponds are supposed to be if you're out there looking at where they are now. You know where they, they should have been historically because of the, uh, you know, the, the topography, their basins, relatively flat areas, small streams, very, very predictable. So this is, this is you know, every, every spot that should have been an open marsh, beaver flowage, um, just looked, uh, was just forested in 1939. Uh, absolutely non-existent. The beavers hadn't returned from the fur trade. Hadn't been there for hundreds of years, in fact. So, so you know, as a result of the fur trade, again, we lost a million, a million of these incredibly rich, precious wetlands um, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. So that, that had an enormous impact on a, on a whole lot of wildlife. Um, but we're lucky, and, and we're getting them back. And it's an ongoing process. Okay, Patty. Has it been a natural uh, regeneration, or has it been reintroduced? It's been, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 has been the, the work of the beavers. Okay. However, in the early days, um, some states did do some relocation to try to give them a leg up. <coughs> uh, you, you know, and, and I guess the, the, the first thing that saved them was a some fashion trends, predictably. It wasn't intelligent human actions. You know, it was, it was a change in, in fashion, what we like to wear in the early 1800s. And that gave them a, just enough of a break that we put, that's probably why we didn't lose them. And it took another hundred years before we, uh, before we enacted legislation to, to prevent them being killed. And, and that was only on the books, you know, for, in most places for a relatively short time. And, as, as the beavers started to recover, we, we went, back to, went back to trapping them. Um, so anyway, but the, the exciting thing about this for me is that you know, we live in the age of the standing dead timber in wetlands. I mean, that's a, a, this is a historical anomaly. 
caused by the fur trade. Um, you know, these trees look, that looks the way it, it does right there because of the arrival of Europeans in 1600, roughly. I mean, so I find that, that fact alone is really interesting. Those long-term um, effects we have in the landscape. Um, but these things are all, you know, in a matter of decades uh, or a century, all these dead trees are going to fall over and all these beaver flowages are again going to be open marshes. So it's fun to live in a time where, where, where a, lot of, a lot of beaver flowages look like this. It's a very interesting landscape. But in fairness, it's not a, a loss of timber. It's just a return of the ancient landscape. And it really makes for some really interesting and beautiful uh, landscapes out there. And uh, great, great, you know, these dead trees are great habitat for a lot of things. Like uh, great blue herons. There they are. <laughs> have, you, have you driven down Route 7 over um, in Arlington? There's those wonderful wetlands on either side. That's where this was. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always looking in these dead snags for nests, and, and you can, almost every one you find something. So they're really, really heavily used. Okay, Penny. Yeah, you can tell by the holes. And another thing that's kind of interesting, a lot of, a lot of uh, woodpeckers, and, and, uh, as one example, will roost, will roost in these snags at night. And if you walk by at dusk, you, you'll flush them out of there. I always feel badly, but... Okay, now we'll talk about flow devices and, and, and the conflict in general. Um, culverts are extremely vulnerable uh, because beavers are economists. They don't want to work harder than they have to. And so these roads represent giant man-made dams with a little tiny hole in them. So, and, and, you know... <laughs> We've put a lot of them on the landscape. You know, we've, we're, we're just so successful. We just, we cover everything, everything. So we've made a lot of conflict points. And, and I, I would hope we would take some responsibility for that fact and not just get angry at uh, other wildlife for what results. <laughs> so this is, this is another picture on the Penobscot Indian land where I, I worked for six years. You know, a, a road going, going right through a, a wetland. You can see beaver dams here. You know, so this is about a 60-acre wetland uh, created by the beaver dam. And there's, there's one conflict point, one conflict point, that road culvert. And so if you kill the beavers, instead of building an effective flow device there, you, you, eliminate, <laughs> you eliminate this entire thing. Maybe not overnight, but certainly in a matter of years, if not decades, it's gone just like they were all gone during the fur trade. So that's why it's so important. And this is what culverts frequently look like, not full circles. And why roads are often like this. And we spend vast sums of money trying to cleaning culverts with equipment. Um, over and over and over and over again and fixing damaged roads and killing beavers and repeating the cycle. <laughs> and I, 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 it doesn't surprise me that uh, much of the Western world is going bankrupt. I'm, I'm afraid to say, if, if, if that's the way we approach every issue, we're, we, we, we have very large brains, but um, for some reason we don't look that far into the future much of the time. This is uh, the Mohawk Nation, um, again, spending money with a crew cleaning the culvert. Can you tell us how the flow devices work? I can try. I can try. <laughs> I'll get to that. I'll do the best I can in a very short amount of time. The, the work is not concentrated enough in any one state, but I have to spend a lot of time traveling. But this has a, a, a pipe system underneath the water out to a nice filter. Um, a couple of things that, that you look for in, in, a, in an effective pipe system. Okay, let me, let me back step just a little bit. The, the, the really exciting thing about this work is, is not only do you have to really, uh, well, you have to be able to fool beavers. You're essentially sneaking water away from, from, from an animal that's spent millions of years finding leaks in dams. 
So that's a, that's a wonderful challenge. Every site's different, so I have to mold my, my devices to fit the, the site. Um, and then, in addition to that, particularly here in the North Country, you have to build a structure that's so strong that the ice isn't going to ruin it. And, and massive floods aren't going to ruin it either. So, so it's, a, it's good fun. Um, yeah, okay, I was going to say about the pipe system. Um, what you're basically um, looking for is, is, is length. And again, you, you don't always, you know, the, the, the topography of the site will sort of dictate how big you can make your, your system. But um, uh, beavers are programmed uh, to look for dam leaks in dams. And so with a solid pipe, you're making a leak, you know, you're extending a leak, making it invisible a long ways away from the dam. That helps make the system robust. But that's not enough because the beavers, they would, if there was not a filter, a filter on the end of the pipe, the beavers would, would find that leak, even if it was a long ways away from the, the uh, dam and, and ultimately clog it. So you have, you know, a good, a good, a good uh, long pipe and a nice big filter. And the filter acts to, to, again, prevent beavers from directly clogging the pipe. But more importantly, it disperses the incoming water over a broad area. Uh, so the beavers don't sense the loss. Beavers are, are they don't do very much deductive reasoning. They're, they're very hardwired. They're very instinctive in their behaviors. So if you eliminate damming stimuli, like the sound of running water, the feel of flowing water, um, and then, and then create, create, create a very unnatural situation, um, you, you, you usually have them. So how does this not drain the wetland? Well, it does. I mean, there's no wetland here. The only way you'd have a wetland right here is if you had a clogged culvert. And a clogged culvert is not acceptable. But well, weren't you trying to preserve the wetland? Absolutely. I'm trying to preserve ecosystems, more specifically. Um, so I, in this particular case, right just upstream is a beaver dam and a nice wetland. So what I do is, is make it possible you know, for live beavers to remain in the ecosystem. Yeah, I can never, I, I never try to manage a beaver dam in a culvert, but, but there's almost always uh, wetlands that they're creating upstream and downstream. And, and they'll travel a long ways, just one thought, just a second, they'll travel a long ways to clog a culvert. They make, you know, hundreds of yards, maybe a quarter mile. So to, to really protect a culvert well, you have to extirpate the beavers in both directions for, for a long ways. Just, just a second. What? I'm thinking like a beaver here. I'm walking down from the beaver dam up there. I come to here. Yeah. Yes, I don't realize that these round things have anything to do with what I'm interested in. But I do see that fence around where the water's flowing out. And I, wouldn't I think, oh, if I block that fence up, um, I'll, I'll be able to have a nice pond here? Maybe. You might be, you might be being generous. To, to use the word thinking at all, but <laughs> no, no, what they would do, I mean, if, if they would start damming in the closest corner to the culvert, particularly if that culvert's making noise, you know, and again, the culvert is part of the system, so I always tell people, you know, try to put the culverts in low and level so they're not noisy, but so many culverts will have a waterfall, hanging culverts will have a waterfall at the end, and that complicates my job. I can still win. But it, it, you know, it's part of the system, and it, and it really it makes things worse if you have all kinds of damning uh, uh, stimuli at, at that point. So they, they would start clogging there. But, but see, it would take them a great deal of time. They could come all the way around that thing and, and never create a pool here. Because, I mean, and, and again, I, I judge the watershed. These are two 12-inch pipes. They move a great deal of water. And so the whole time the beavers are working there, they're vulnerable, and they know it. They are are not comfortable not being close to a pool of water. They're not going to spend much time there because of that fact. And so that's, uh, that, I mean, that system, it will, you know, it'll, it'll be there for, for decades and never, never be a problem. I can't say that about every site, but most sites I can, I can do that. Occasionally you run into more, uh, you know, uh, more greater challenges and you have to, might have to retrofit or something. Yes? Question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's right. You got to have. You got to have a good big filter. And what's the material inside that enclosure? Inside. I don't know. Right there. I mean, it looks like a 
I don't think. Oh well. Are you talking here? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just mud. There's no wood in there. Yeah. What keeps them from chewing through your wooden fence? I have wire on on it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean that's a good question because most people don't build with wood because they the first thought is oh beavers chew wood you can't use it but. I mean, why would anybody want to build a structure like this without using a wooden frame? I mean, it's just, it's just a great material to work with. But you, you do have to protect it from chewing. It's, it's not hard to do. What's the filter made out of? The filter is made out of uh, a four gauge, a quarter inch diameter steel mesh. This is a six by six inch mesh. It's epoxy coated because uh, the waters in the eastern forests are so acidic, they dissolve steel. Uh, so I'm just, I'm not satisfied with a decade or less uh, longevity in these things. I want, I want to get 30, 40 years if I can. Uh, I, want to, I want to deliver the best value. And as I get older in life, I, 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 I appreciate more and more how quickly a decade goes by, too. It's so <laughs> just not enough, not enough. So that, that epoxy coating is very important. Um, it's 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 uh it's rare it's rare yeah um, this this uh, m most of my stuff I get from a place south of Boston uh, Barker Steel they also have offices in other places it's it's used in bridges and you know to resist the salt we put on the roads yeah I, I don't encourage uh, I don't I, I you know I don't encourage people to try this at home. <laughs> I did for a long time, and boy, my attitude's really changing. I've seen, I've seen thousands of failures, failed flow device attempts. I've been doing it so long. I mean, I, in addition to you know, studying beavers my whole life, I spent 10 years in construction. I can build a, a simple structure. Um, and, and sometimes I, I really struggle as well. And, and there's just so much to it, combined with the fact that every site's different. Um, I encourage you to to hire me if, if you can. If you, <laughs> I know that sounds self-serving, but I, I don't like to see people fail either. And I do live right here in Vermont. You know, I don't have to come from, I don't have to come from Colorado. Is your purpose in most all of these flow devices to move the dam upstream, to get the beavers to move the dam upstream? No, they, they're free to do whatever they want. And they're alive to do it. So, what, whatever. Um, so if they dam right up against your fence, the covert, there's still water draining through yeah, the covert. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Levelers. Yeah, I mean, when I first started building beaver deceivers, I built them really big because I didn't have pipe systems in my arsenal. Um, and, and that was really labor intensive. And then I found that ultimately the beavers would dam around them anyways. And so over time, and I'm constantly adapting and trying to improve my designs, I come up with a new technique at almost every site. Uh, over time, because of the double filter concept, I've been able to shrink that beaver deceiver way back, way back to a simple four-poster four poster design, which is much less labor intensive, but, but, but completely adequate. And this, this is a, a caster master and a beaver dam. Um, the, you know, it's two, basically two different types of conflict sites, uh, regular beaver dams away from man-made structures, and uh, uh, or, or man-made outlets and, and road culverts. And there's a very different approach at each, each type of site. And, and you basically, in, in, in this situation, you're just trying to move enough of the water, enough of the year, to control the vertical growth of the beaver dam. Um, so you, typically it doesn't require that big a pipe. Um, because beavers dam, um, you know, at or near the water surface, if you're holding the water down through much of the damming season, they won't be adding, adding uh, materials during that time. And so when a big flood comes, it'll, it'll, it'll pass over a dam that's much shorter than it would otherwise be. But the, but the dam and the system are just like the culvert and the, and the system. They're all, this, they're all the one. You have, to, you have to tie into a beaver dam. You can't just throw a system out there someplace. Yeah. You have to be very delicate that you don't, you know, you don't destroy the dam or it's how, very different. How do you move the water over the dam? Well, uh, it's just gravity goes through the pipe. The, you know, every site's different. Sometimes the pipe is straight. Sometimes if you're trying to, um, you know, it depends on the, the threat to the human properties. 
sometimes you can, you can manage it higher, and then you kind of hump the pipe over the dam, and it's just gravity. When the water reaches that point, it'll run through the pipe. That's going to make a splashing sound, and then the beavers get all unhappy? Well, good, good, good question. Um, I, the, the upstream end of the pipe, you should always try to keep underwater. The water acts as a silencing mechanism. Not always possible, but most of the time it is. And then I, and this, these are some new concepts. The six by six inch mesh is problematic uh, because uh, beavers come in all sizes. And, and, and yet you want to you want a coarse mesh. You don't want a real fine mesh because then just things like leaves would clog it easily. Um, but sometimes little beavers will, will go through the six inch mesh and cause you great problems. And they also, beavers get stuck in it sometimes too. And if they're underwater, they drown. So it's, it's not perfect, uh, not, not, not designed with beavers in mind, but it's what we have, what industry makes. Um, so what I do is I, I frequently will make a second fence inside, and I call it a misery uh, multiplier, um, and so it just makes it difficult on them. And then this is very important. This is a, a, a piece of plywood over the top of the, the pipe because um, the pipes, a, a whirlpool will develop uh, frequently at the end of the pipe, and if that hits the surface, it creates a sucking sound and the beavers are on top of it. <laughs> so there's a lot, a lot to it. Next please, Penny. Yeah, there's another little example of a, uh, of a misery multiplier on the inside. Next please. Another spot, this is up in Sharon, Sharon, Vermont. This is an awful culvert, awful culvert. Great big waterfall at the end of it. Noisy, undersized. So it's, it's been difficult. And in, in addition to that, a very rich habitat. Very rich habitat. And then, in these last few months, we've had an extended period of high flows. So I've had, this, I've had the beavers really dam around this, throwing stuff into the top. You know, but I... I I just have to clean it out. I know I'm going to win. It's just no question. <laughs> I, I'm serious. There's no question in my mind that, that I, can, I can win. I can, I can adapt the design a little bit. They'll get discouraged. Um, they don't, they don't want to waste their, their energy. And then I'll try to get the town to fix that culvert, and we'll be all set. And what does the Labrador do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> Except for distract me. Yeah. Yeah, this is the original beaver deceiver up in Grafton. I don't normally build a stone wall as part of it, but it was on my own property, so I, I, got, I got fancy. This has been, I've been lucky, so lucky to have that property because it's, uh, you know, there's a town road that runs right through the middle of it. So I, without that, and you saw that what I call the, uh, the uh, um, you yeah, know, what do I call it? God. Okay, I need a drink. I need a drink. Terraces, the terraces. You know, those, those have taken decades to develop. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's still, you know, after, after a nearly a 40-year beaver presence there, there's still wetlands nearby that are developing. Um, you know, downstream, there's finally a second, you know, we have a mile-long stream. There's finally a second colony of beavers down there. It's taken 40 years. So it's, it's a very slow slow process, uh, but it never could have happened, any of it, without this one flow device, because the beavers would have had to have been killed. Uh, Penobscot Nation of Maine, just another, another example. This is a much bigger watershed, a bigger system. Um, this is called a square fence, aren't I clever? 15-inch uh, <laughs> pipe, uh, 40 feet long. In a nice big filter, you have to bigger pipe, bigger filter. Is that tile? What? Is that tile? Tile? Fresh, fresh water or salt? Oh no, it's fresh. Yeah, yeah, it's north of north of Bangor. Well, that pipe looks like it was going uphill. Um, shouldn't be. I think that was an illusion. Yeah, I don't want to want that because then, then it would be noisy. Yeah, the downstream was to the right. On that one, yeah. obviously through the bridge. More and more was sticking out of the water as it went to the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I want. Yeah, so it's going downhill in an upstream direction. Yeah, yeah. You want that the end of that pipe to be underwater, where it comes, water comes in. 
Now just another round fence with little some ribs in it in a, in a uh, whirlpool break in Massachusetts. This is a railroad uh, culvert in Massachusetts. Nice double filter system. You see it, two different types of pipes. This is PVC and the others, the black stuff is polyethylene. They have very different uh, properties. This is a four by four inch mesh. You see the big, big difference. There will never be any beavers getting inside there, but, but um, may clog a little bit easier. Next, please, Patty. Ah, this is out in Martinez, California. Uh, one little beaver dam there. And uh, God, you wouldn't believe it. When I worked there, every television uh, outlet in San Francisco was there. <laughs> there were trucks everywhere, cameras everywhere, helicopters overhead. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, yeah, speaking of tidal, this is tidal. This is very interesting, and that's why I propped this pipe up higher, because the, the tide, the high tides come right up over the beaver dam. So they're living, you know, most of the time it's fresh water above here, um, which they need to drink, you know, but they, they go down into the tidal region to, to, to feed. Um, yeah, very, very interesting site. And this is, um, this is just... You know, sometimes you'll have 100 people out here watching the beavers because right in the middle of town, there's a Starbucks right up in there. <laughs> and they've taken, they've, because it's, 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 it's such good viewing, they've taken an enormous amount of video and they've, they've just learned and, and observed a whole lot that you, you, you might never, um, out in the wild, unless you're Patty. What's what? What's the name of the town again? Martinez. Yep, it's... Uh, the home of Joan DiMaggio. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is uh, up in Maine at the, at the Holton Band of Maliseets. Another double filter system. You get, I think you're getting an idea by now, huh? Yeah. Yep. How many systems have you put in? I don't know. It's probably approaching 1,000 by now. Wow. Yeah. yeah. This is in Virginia. Virginia is very tough. They get these tremendous hurricane rains, evidently. And so you, get, you have these little trickles of flow, and you'll have six giant culverts lined up. Is, and I have to protect them all. So, but, and then there's, uh, yeah, so like that, like that. So you, don't, you don't see that up here very much. So well, it's more, more work. And they occasionally get snow and ice. And then, he's, then, then the cars are just off the road everywhere. Yeah. I'm going, I, I think I'm moving away from the round fences. I, I really like square fences. I love wooden, using wooden frames. There's just so much you can do with them. Uh, this is this Jim Wilson's here, my neighbor. Jim, this is a site over on Hakey Road in Grafton. It's, it's been a big problem. See how that, the fencing is staggered there? This is the first time years ago I, I, I realized that small beavers were clogging this culvert by pulling vast amounts of debris through those holes. <laughs> and so then I staggered the fence and it ended. It ended. But these beavers, they, they, this is a rich habitat too, and they want to claim it in the worst way. And so they've been so persistent. And I, 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 I almost always put pieces of flooring in so the beavers can't dig underneath. These beaver, beavers dug right underneath the, my flooring, and, uh, and so I've had to go back and, and, and clog these holes over and over again. The last time, uh, you know, so I did that, and then the last time they came underneath this pipe with a great big hole, and I didn't see it. I didn't know it was there because it was underneath the pipe. <laughs> but you've got you to be persistent. You've got to stick with it. You, know? you don't just walk away, and, and that, that kind of problem is, is rare in the big picture, but occasionally... <coughs> Penobscot land again. I was proud to say uh, this was quite a while ago now in the 90s. We were the first, Penobscot Nation, the first major landowner in the world to totally beaver proof their, their uh, roads without, without the need to kill any beavers. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just such a boon. I mean, even if you're a, a trapper, what it means is just far more animals available in the winter. You go back, please, Patty. Yeah. Far more, uh, you know, beavers, better habitat, so you have more fur bears of all kinds, more waterfowl, more, more 
deer, healthier moose. It just goes on and on and on. And, and, and more money, too, in the budget, uh, hopefully. Again, a, a, a two uh, little system. This is a, a dry little place, but when, when, it gets, uh, when the rains come, it becomes a very good beaver habitat. So. But uh, one, thing, one thing I'll point out here is, is you'll notice that the, the great uh, differences in designs. And that's why it's, it's very hard for me to just tell people you know, to do this. Um, I, I, I have to mold them to fit the topography, and they're, they're all different. Go ahead, please. Now, this is really all you need to know. If, you, if you're questioning yourself, you know, can we make flow devices work? Can we outsmart beavers? Don't study flow devices. You know, find out the mass of these relative objects, the relative mass of these objects. This is the beaver brain, and that's the human brain. <laughs> so, you know... People think beavers are so smart, but if, if they did even the most basic deductive reasoning, a flow device could never work. You know, they, you see the water coming out the downstream end of the pipe? Okay, we need to dam the upstream end of the pipe. That's it. Thank God they don't do it. Next, please. Yeah, that's a study that came out a while back. And acres, you know, and... Flood control, ecological values, uh, wildlife viewing. My God, these, these, uh, when, when these wetlands, particularly when they occur at a roadside, it's, I mean, on my property, people are constantly stopping to view the wildlife. It has a great value to society. Um, but this is, this is you know, roughly what he came up with. I guess they, they help to recharge aquifers. It's, it's just all kinds of things. $8,000 per acre per year. That's a lot of money on top of whatever you might save um, in, in road maintenance if, if you're um, implementing good flow devices. Okay, we're getting close to the end, and you guys have been a great audience and, and really patient, and I hopefully not too oxygen starved. <laughs> but this, this has just been the most uh, amazing thing to watch in my lifetime. Um, my parents dug a, a man-made pond, no different than, than any other man-made pond that you see, essentially sterile. You know, people like to have things clean. They don't like messes. And so, you know, steep banks, really no wetland, no shallow water wetland habitat at all. You know, for years it never produced a single brood of ducks. And then, you know... Um, my parents, I was, a, I was a small small kid, but they had me kill the first beavers, first two beavers that came in there. And even then, I knew I didn't want to do it. I knew it was wrong, but by God, they were eating the exotic plants my parents had, had planted. You know, God forbid, you know, they were, they were no different than most other people. You know, no tolerance, no tolerance. But eventually, I refused to do that anymore, and, I, I, and, and we just let things go. And so after years and decades... The beavers of building that dam up, it eventually came over the top of that steep bank, and now all around the wetland you just have incredibly rich shallow water wetland habitat, and numerous broods of ducks, and thousands of frogs, and, and on and on and on and on. And so, all for the cost of one flow device. I mean, amazing values. Um, excuse me? Yeah, my father built that for me. Yeah, but that's, you know, yeah, that's long since gone. All the trees have drowned. And, yeah. Okay, next, please. Yeah. No, that uh, looks like the same shot. That's funny. Anyways, here's a little bit, a little bit separate section. Again, was high ground with, with pine trees on it, and now it's just a rich, a rich marsh. There's the beaver, the beaver uh, lodge that Patty showed you earlier. Yeah, in the field. See the field? <laughs> that was mowed. That was mowed every year, too. And so there, that was not... You can't have beavers if you don't have beaver food. And so I do a, I do a great deal to, to grow beaver food. And, and one of the most important things I've done is not mow the field for 20 years. So now we have this great, great, rich, early successional habitat that, that, that is used by numerous species, but also provides some food for the beavers. And on this side of the pond, I've done some clear cutting. And uh, it's got to keep at it. 
It's, it's awful cheap investment, though, for the wetland values that you get. Next, please, Patty. I think we're, yeah, this is the final one, guys. <laughs> Not quite the final, but that's, again, on the Penobscot land. Just before I took this picture, a great big bull moose walked across and back. And this is a triple, actually a triple lodge. And, and <laughs> not only that, let me go on. Yeah, there was also a bald eagle circling around. <laughs> dozens and dozens of ducks coming and going. And I think this is the, probably the biggest uh, beaver created wetland in the world. Um, it's right, it's, it's almost 80 acres. It's, it's perfectly flat country. And again, the clay makes for really um, non-porous dams and the lack of trapping for a while anyways. Um, pretty, cool, pretty cool land. And then I, I have some contact information here. Um, you can, I have, a, I have a contact information web page. I don't have a full-fledged website. That's, uh, that's in, the, in, the, in the offing. That's uh, beaverdeceivers.com. And I'm in the phone book and I live in Grafton. So if you, if you need help, I'd be glad to provide it. Thank you. <laughs>